Hello and welcome to another episode of The Beer Chronicles, the show that gives me an excuse to stock up on more beers than could be considered healthy. As of the day I'm filming this, um, the latest James Bond film, No Time to Die, has just been released in cinemas. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I will go see it soon and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, who knows, by the time this video goes up I might have already seen it, but at the time of recording I haven't seen it yet. But in preparation to see that film, I have recently been watching through the Daniel Craig James Bond films, and I've highly enjoyed my experience. It's not the first time I've watched them, but you know, I fancied a bit of a catch-up before going to see the new one. And as such, that has left me in the mood to talk a bit about James Bond, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. And while doing that, I'm going to be drinking a bottle of Heineken, which is the beer promoted in Skyfall, I believe. Where, you know, there's so many shots in that film of people just drinking Heineken. Uh, actually, a lot of people um, complained about that, about the amount of uh, Heineken placement in that film, and also saying James Bond isn't the kind of character who would just drink Heineken. He drinks fancy martinis and such, and you know, expensive scotches and brandies and whatnot. Uh, he he wouldn't just drink a Heineken. I disagree. I think that he probably would. He'd drink anything alcoholic. He would opt for the fanciest stuff. And when drinking a Heineken, he might comment on how, you know, non-elegant it is. But he'd still drink the fucking thing. And also, I think Daniel Craig's response to that criticism was the perfect response, really. Um, he basically said, films are expensive to make. Get over it. Which I couldn't agree more with him there, really. It is the perfect, most eloquent response to that situation. I have had Heineken before, but uh, let's just see what I think of it for the video. It's got a, um, Heineken's got quite a potent smell, to be fair. Yep, it's um, it's quite a flavourful lager, really. Sort of um, a bitter, almost sour kind of flavour, which is weird, but you know it's there, and you know a hint of hoppiness as well. It's alright. Not necessarily the lager I would choose if I was in the mood for a lager. Um, I'll admit that, but it's fine, and if handed one, I will gladly drink it with no complaints. So when it comes to James Bond, I'm a bit of a fan. I grew up watching the films, and I still watch them to this day. I have them all on uh, DVD mostly, but then the Daniel Craig ones I have on Blu-ray. Uh, I have the box set actually behind me of the Ian Fleming novels, and I haven't read all of them. But I have read the first few and I'm making my way through, and so far I'm really enjoying them. Uh, the next one I need to read is from Russia With Love, I believe. And you may hear me say that I've got to read from Russia With Love next, and you might think, um, Brad, you said that you've read the first few, how are you only on from Russia With Love? And that's because the books and the films are in completely different orders. In fact, most of the films uh, take the names of the novel and then just do their own thing with it and completely disregard what happens in the book anyway. It's only a select few really where the uh, the film and the novel are, you know, quite close to each other, where the film reflects the source material accurately. It doesn't happen very often. One of the best examples of that happening is probably on Her Majesty's Secret Service, where they pretty much just took the novel and made it into a film. That's one that gets talked about a lot, but also I haven't yet read that book, so I can't personally say how accurate it is, but it is known for being accurate, so... But yeah, I haven't read enough of the books yet to talk about the books that much. But I am going to talk today about the films, specifically about the actors who have portrayed Bond. I'm going to go through each of them, uh, sort of explain each one a bit, give my thoughts on them, and then at the end I'm going to attempt uh, to rank my favourite Bond actors. That's going to be fun. So I have, I've got a ranking set out right next to me. And even now, looking at it, I'm like, um, am I sure this is... Is this my final decision? 
because it, it was so hard to work out where to put people on this list and it, it kept changing as I was writing it and it's really really difficult to rank. Firstly I just need to say I think all the Bond actors did a great job. I don't think there is a bad Bond. But let's go through each of them and talk about them specifically. So first off, Sean Connery. Sean Connery, absolute legend in and out of the James Bond movies. Uh, he is just, he is a fantastic presence. You can definitely believe in some of the more rougher physical scenes that he is the kind of person who could pull off that kind of thing and you know you can believe that Sean Connery himself would be that intimidating and then when it comes to the more sort of elegant side of Bond you know the um the suits the cars the martinis <coughs> he pulls that stuff off very well I do think Sean Connery looks very good in a suit And when it comes to cars, I mean, he was the Bond who had the Aston Martin DB5. That is the best car in all of the Bond franchise, and if you think otherwise, then you are wrong. I mean, when it comes to his run as Bond, he had the first Bond movie, Doctor No, which set the precedent for the whole franchise going forward. He then followed that up with From Russia With Love, which is an amazing film and a fan favourite to this day. And then Goldfinger came right after that, which is the best Bond film of all time. Personally, I'm not as keen on Fundable, although I do still like it and will gladly watch it. Uh, it's not one of my favourites out of the lot. You Only Live Twice, obviously that has um, Donald Pleasance as Blofeld. And he is just great in that movie. Blofeld is absolutely phenomenal and is probably the main reason to watch that movie uh, but it's worth it just for him and then after Lazenby came in with On Mostly Secret Service Sean Connery came back for Diamonds Are Forever that one is a little bit different from the others that one's a bit more cheesy tongue-in-cheek comedy focused uh, not as you know not as serious as the other Bond films before it and it depends what kind of mood you're in. If you're in the mood for that kind of movie then Diamonds Are Forever is fine, it's a fun romp, it's a great movie to, uh, to sort of suspend your disbelief and just sink in and have a good time. But yeah, if you're looking for your more serious spy espionage films, uh, Diamonds Are Forever it isn't the best one to go through. If you're in the mood for something more serious, that will leave a bad taste in your mouth. But if you're in the mood for it, then I think it's great. Uh, Mr. Winter, Mr. Kid. I... A lot of people don't like them. I fucking love them. Le Bombe Surprise. That's just wonderful. Actually, a long time ago on this channel, I did a review of a Doctor Who serial called Dragonfire. I did that review with a friend of mine called James. Now, James is also a massive fan of the James Bond films and we talk about Bond with each other all the time and we often quote Le Bombe Surprise to each other all the fucking time because it's just amazing. So yeah, really, depending on your mood going in, Diamonds of Forever is either a great romp, a fun time, or one of the weaker Bond films in the whole franchise. It just really depends on your mood. The next up we have uh, George Lazenby who was Bond for one film and one film only on Her Majesty's Secret Service which is the greatest Bond movie of all time. It is an absolutely amazing film and when I get round to reading that novel I'm really really looking forward to that. It's kind of weird because in the film franchise it comes after You Only Live Twice and in You Only Live Twice you see Blofeld for the first time and then this sort of follows it up. But in the novels, um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service was actually the first time that you see Blofeld. That was when he was revealed. And because the film of On Her Majesty's Secret Service is so faithful to the novel, when Bond and Blofeld meet each other in that movie, it very much does feel like they're meeting for the first time because it's such an accurate recreation of the events of the novel and in the novel they are meeting for the first time so it doesn't really feel like a sequel to You Only Live Twice even though it's supposedly the same character 
it doesn't feel like it. Um, he's played by a different actor. Bond is also played by a different actor. These two characters have seen each other before, but they are acting like they've never seen each other before. So it's just got this really weird feeling to it. It really makes it stand out, not in a good way, from the rest of the franchise. But as its own individual property, it is an amazing Bond film. It is absolutely spectacular. And if you've grown up with the sort of opinion that it's not a great Bond film, which a lot of people had at the time when it came out, I highly recommend going back and watching it again now with a more mature mindset and you might be surprised with how great a film it actually really is. Unfortunately when it comes down to it, George Lazenby himself as Bond isn't necessarily that great in the role. He was an Australian model before making this movie, he had pretty much no acting experience whatsoever and it does come across a bit. His acting isn't terrible, but it's probably the weakest that we've had in the whole franchise, to be honest. He still did an okay job, and he definitely looks the part, but when it comes down to it, he didn't act it the best. And there are scenes in it where he sort of has to put on a different accent, and George Lazenby couldn't do it, so they got him to mouth the lines and dubbed over it with a different voice actor and it really stands out and it, it just doesn't feel natural to watch those bits and I can't understand why they did it because there's no reason to me why he couldn't have just spoken with his normal Bond accent it's not like anyone there would have recognised him he's going in there as a person, as a character who they'd never seen or heard before so why would he need to talk differently and they'd never seen or heard him before even though Blofeld had seen him in a previous film um, he was clearly looking at his face and meant to believe that he's not James Bond and yet but for some reason he has to change his voice and I don't understand why I don't understand why that was necessary maybe just because it happened in the book and they wanted to be more faithful I don't know but that's that's a change I would have made if I was writing for the film, especially considering the fact that George Lazenby couldn't do the voice and someone else had to dub over it. Other than that though, the film itself, stellar, absolutely stellar movie. And then after that we get Roger Moore. Roger Moore, who doesn't love Roger Moore as James Bond? He was Bond for the longest run of movies, um, did the most Bond movies out of any of the actors if we don't count Never Say Never Again, and let's face it, we don't count Never Say Never Again. As Bond, he could still do what needed to be done, but he was a lot less action-oriented and more sort of infiltrating, suave, sophisticated, those kind of um, aspects to Bond. He brought a lot of sophistication to the role and a bit more emotion to it perhaps and he really is just Roger Moore himself is wonderful to watch on screen he's such a charming charming man and on and off camera he just fucked everyone fair play highlights for him I'm going to give a bit of a hot take at this point uh, the man with the golden gun is regarded by many to be a terrible Bond film, one of the worst in fact. Uh, it is one of my favourites. I think The Man With The Golden Gun is a brilliant Bond film and I do not understand all the hate it gets because I think it is great. It's one of the ones where if I'm in the mood for a Roger Moore film I'll often opt to go specifically for The Man With The Golden Gun. I really like it. Christopher Lee as Scaramanga is just wonderful in the role, the same as he is in any role he does. The Golden Gun itself is a wonderful little gadget. I do like how it's just made up of these little gold objects that combine together into a gun. Really clever and really wonderful to see. And a wonderful prop for any fan to have in their home if you can get hold of it. <coughs> and Knickknack's just hilarious. And then of course The Man with the Golden Gun is immediately followed by The Spy Who Loved Me, which is the best Bond film of all time. You know, it's just a truly wonderful film. Some great set pieces, some great locations. Um, wonderful in pretty much every way, really, that film. Uh, the introduction of Jaws as a henchman, um, he's just 
it's Jaws, what more do I need to say? He's probably, when it comes to all the Bond franchise, when you think of the henchmen of the villains, the top ones have got to be Jaws and Odd Job. Those are just the ones that always spring to mind for everyone, really, I think. Jaws is wonderful in that film. Uh, in Moonraker, he takes on a bit of a more comical approach that I don't think really fits his character that well. He's much better in The Spy Who Loves Me. Uh, if I was to give any faults to the Roger Moore run, I would say probably that the later end of his movies, where he's... Uh, getting a bit older and not really as good in the role as he used to be. Those movies don't tend to be as good. I mean, they're fine, and I still enjoy watching all of them. But I think the the end of his run, really, it is just a couple of movies that are a bit more forgettable than the rest of them. I mean, I do still love them, and I do still love him in the role, but I think that when he finally left the role and let someone else take over, it was definitely time for him to do that which leads us neatly into Timothy Dalton as James Bond. Wonderful Bond. If you're going by the James Bond in the novels, the way that he's characterised in them, Timothy Dalton is probably the best example of that character being taken out of the novels and put on screen. He made sure to read all the novels before you know, filming for his movies, and he really does nail the character. And that was definitely his intent. He went into those movies wanting to be more faithful to the books and play that kind of Bond character rather than what the movies had turned him into, which was someone a bit more suave, sophisticated, more about looking good, the suits, the drinks, the expensive stuff. You know, That's not who Bond really was as a character in the novels. I mean, there was that aspect to him. He definitely knew what was good and what wasn't and liked the finer things in life. But he also wasn't unwilling to get his hands dirty, wear the kind of clothes that were more suitable to a situation rather than always wearing suits for everything he did. And you know, he was suave when it was suitable in the situation, but you know, when he needed to concentrate more on what he was doing and you know, just be a bit more... I'm trying to think of how to describe it because this isn't scripted and I'm just making this up my head as I go along, but when he needed to be a bit more focused on the job and rough and not as sophisticated but just do what needs to be done he very much could do that and I think Timothy Dalton pulls off that perfectly he is absolutely wonderful in the role of James Bond and is the most James Bond like of all the actors to play the role when compared to the books he only did two movies unfortunately I do think he could have done with you know doing one or two more really um, I think The Living Daylights is the weaker of the two in my opinion, although I do know plenty of people who think it the other way around. Uh, but for me, The Living Daylights is the weaker of the two. Um, pretty much, it, it's a forgettable plot, I don't even remember the plot of it now, thinking about it. Um, the villain of the movie, Brad Whittaker, isn't really a very memorable villain. And overall it's just... It's good, it's a good movie, it's absolutely fine to watch, uh, not the best, but for me the highlight of Timothy Dalton's run is definitely Licence to Kill. Licence to Kill is it's the greatest Bond movie of all time. It's really a character piece for Bond and it allows you to view his character more so than just him being on a mission and you just watch how he handles that. This movie is a lot more personal. Rather than being sent on a mission, his friend basically gets attacked and then he uses his skills to sort of get vengeance on the people who did that and it is very much more a story of Bond himself out for vengeance going rogue and just really letting hell loose on this company which he infiltrates and pretends to befriend the people in just to get closer to them and it's just it, it's a wonderful exploration of Bond's skills that are utilised in a way that we hadn't yet seen up to that point because it's always him uh, doing it for Queen and Country and now it's him doing it for himself and I really appreciated seeing that sort of side to the character. And after Timothy Dalton we move on to Pierce Brosnan. Now when it comes to suave and sophisticated Pierce Brosnan nails that absolutely. You just look at him and think he is one handsome, suave man and looks wise he really just 
he just looks like a James Bond, doesn't he? He really fits that aspect, um, particularly the sort of characteristics that Roger Moore brought into the role. He reflects that perfectly. <coughs> Possibly, in my opinion, some of the best gadgets come from this era of James Bond. Um, who doesn't love the exploding pen? Uh, some great, uh, some great watches. Uh, cars that can do so many things. Sunglasses, mobile phones, all capable of doing all these different functions. I really think that the Pierce Brosnan era was sort of the best era for that kind of thing. Also, he started off with such a strong opening with Goldeneye. Goldeneye is the greatest Bond movie of all time. It's so wonderful. Just that opening scene with the dam that sets the tone for the whole movie going forward. Uh, you see what happens to his partner Alex Trevelyan and he later on gets revealed, spoilers, he later on gets revealed to be the villain of the movie and it's just so wonderfully done and Sean Bean is great in that role as, uh, as Alec. A great supporting cast, some wonderful set pieces and sequences and just an all round fantastic film. And then you've got Tomorrow Never Dies after that which is an underrated movie but really go back and watch it because it is really good. I think it's overshadowed by what came before and what came after. You know, Goldeneye was such a great opening and then Tomorrow Never Dies had the um, had the difficult job of following that up. And then The World Is Not Enough came afterwards and I think The World Is Not Enough is an amazing Bond film as well. And so Tomorrow Never Dies sort of sits in the middle of those and is easily forgotten. But it is in itself a great movie. But yeah, The World Is Not Enough, that is just fantastic. If it wasn't for Goldeneye then The World Is Not Enough would be the one that I would be lauding as a masterpiece. But Goldeneye, yeah, well enough, it's a great movie and a great example of how you can really sort of break convention and use the trope of the Bond girl to subvert your expectations, have her revealed to be the main villain. Fantastic idea. Not the only time it's been done, but probably one of the best examples of it being done. Truly, truly great movie. Absolutely love The World Is Not Enough. It's one of the ones that I watched the most growing up, mainly because we had it on video, and so it was just available to me. But yeah, I did truly enjoy it. Unfortunately, that is followed by Die Another Day, which is arguably the worst James Bond movie. If you ask Bond fans what the worst James Bond movie is, it tends to be one of three... I would say one of four, but I think nowadays people are finally accepting that On Her Majesty's Secret Service is actually a masterpiece of a Bond movie. And they're finally realising that it is not the worst Bond movie of all time by any means. It is a fantastic film. So nowadays it sort of falls down to three. Uh, Dying of a Day, uh, Quantum of Solace and Spectre. And right now I have no idea what people are saying about No Time to Die. I'm sort of, I am ignoring all the reviews on that and waiting until I see the movie so that I, you know, I don't get spoiled by what's going to happen. I'm really looking forward to seeing it, but on with whatever the fuck this is. After Die Another Day, we then have the Daniel Craig Bond films, which sort of reboot the franchise. Because up until this point, right from uh, Sean Connery's first movie, Doctor No, all the way up to Die Another Day, we've had all these different actors in the role. But it's always been the same character and they are all supposed to be canon to each other so even though the actor changes we are still following the same long storyline sort of when it comes to actually looking at the canon of the movies a lot of stuff contradicts each other and it's actually it's really difficult to look at it all as one giant canon even though it technically is but when it comes to each movie they just think about what's going to make this a good movie and don't really think about the bigger picture of the whole franchise and as such there are a lot of issues when it comes to canon but it is technically supposed to all still be part of the same canon until Daniel Craig comes along and then it sort of reboots the franchise and starts again from scratch so Daniel Craig's movies are all their own like self-contained franchise within this bigger franchise and now that Daniel Craig has supposedly made his last Bond film, uh, whoever fills the role next, I don't know whether they're going to continue 
as if they are that character, or whether they're going to start again from scratch with their own sort of little mini franchise. I don't know. At this point, I think the Daniel Craig Bond films have sort of set that precedent, and I think it works. It works well enough that they should probably keep that going. Plus, when you just look at the story, the whole thing with Daniel Craig's Bond is, you know, a lot of it is about him being old, part of the old way. He's retired so many times in just like five films. Really, I think following that character with a new actor playing the same character and trying to extend that franchise beyond that point is kind of pointless and I think they should just reboot again. Again, who knows, it may fully depend on the ending of No Time to Die, which I still need to see. But when it comes to the other Daniel Craig Bond films, he starts off with Casino Royale, which is the greatest Bond movie of all time. Truly wonderful adaption of the first Ian Fleming James Bond novel. It understands what to do in an adaption as well, I feel. It very much takes the necessities of that novel and so it is still essentially the same story that you're seeing being told on screen but it also knows exactly what needs to be changed in order to make it work more as a movie and in order to make it more relevant to the audience watching it. I think it is a truly wonderful masterpiece of a movie. The best opening to a Bond movie ever? Probably? Yeah, with the um, with the free running at the start, it's just an amazing sequence, and really, really sort of demonstrates right from the off who this character is, because the way that he chases down uh, this guy who does all this free running stuff, and he's just charging through everything to get to him, it really just it shows how he's still skilled, but also brutish and much more straight about things, and it's just. It's hard to describe without you just watching it, but if you haven't seen it, then you really owe it to yourself to see Casino Royale because it is a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen as Le Chief does a fantastic job. He is not the Le Chief from the novel, but I think the character he plays works wonderfully for the film. And the main plot points to do with that character still take place, really, um, other than... Other than the cheating aspect, I think in the novel they were playing a baccarat instead of a Texas Hold'em poker, and Le Chief was originally cheating to earn winnings from that, and Bond realised what he was doing, he was using a shiner, uh, which if you don't know that is a term for when you have something reflective on the table, so that when you pass a card over it, uh, you can glance at its reflection and see what it is, and you know, obviously that's a way to cheat. I think if they tried to implement that in the film it wouldn't make so much sense these days because the sort of setting that that card game takes place at would be an establishment that would look for that kind of thing nowadays. It's a lot more well known and easier to spot whereas back when the Casino Royale novel was written it might have been a bit more believable that people wouldn't realise that sort of thing was going on but uh, yeah, they would definitely spot that nowadays, and that would not <laughs> that would not work. Do not go into a casino and try to use a shiner. You will not come out of that unscathed. So yeah, that's sort of ignored, and instead of Le Chief being a character who sort of cheats his way into money and becomes very cocky because he just sort of knows he's going to win, um, he's instead a very intelligent character who wins with skill and intellect and just expects to win and then when his ultimate plan involves winning all this money at this card game then Bond comes along and is a better card player than him and just wins. It seems like you know he's surprised that his plan fell through but how can you put so much stake into just a game of chance. This is me picking flaws with the movie now, but it's still like, you know, an amazing film. Definitely, definitely worth a watch. But then that's followed by Quantum of Solace, which a lot of people regard to be one of the worst Bond movies, and I sort of did think that as well for the most part, until I watched through the Daniel Craig films again recently. And on this on this watch through, I don't know, I just something clicked with me. I enjoyed it a lot more this time around than I had done previously. 
I think one aspect of that was probably because I watched it so recently after watching Casino Royale the next night in fact and so it's very much set up to be a sequel to Casino Royale it's pretty much the first time a Bond film has ever been made to be a direct sequel to the Bond film that came before it yeah when you sort of go into it with um, the knowledge of the previous film still fresh in your mind and knowing that it is a sequel to that and you're watching it with that mindset it just it works more also I think one of the biggest disappointments for that film is that you know people come to expect certain things from Bond movies they expect big action set pieces and this movie has those but it's not really the main focus of it this is less of an action movie and more of a sort of character piece uh, we really explore the character of James Bond uh, how he's dealing with the betrayal and death of the woman that he's fallen in love with and how ultimately by the end of the film he has to sort of get over that and become the secret agent that he needs to be who just focuses on the mission again and doesn't let his own feelings and emotion get in the way of that and then you also have the Bond girl of that movie uh, Camille who is in a sort of similar situation to Bond has sort of uh, same sort of thing going on emotionally for her and hers is a story of revenge and Bond is sort of helping her achieve that and I think a lot of people are let down by it because you know after so long of James Bond they just come to expect certain things and if you go into this not expecting those things and take it for what it is it actually does its job very well it's just you know after so long it finally tried to do something different and I've sort of got to respect it for that And then we, uh, and then we move on to Skyfall, which you know, a lot of people love and rightly so. When this movie first came out, I couldn't decide which I preferred out of Casino Royale and Skyfall. They were both amazing, both still are amazing. But I think on this watch through, I have come to realise that Casino Royale is still the better film, but Skyfall is still wonderful. And then Spectre is the other film that many people dislike and I don't see why because when it first came out in the cinema and still to this day I love it. I think it is a great Bond film and I do not see why people give it so much hate. I think Daniel Craig continues to do a wonderful job in that movie. I think Christoph Waltz as uh, spoilers again, uh, Blofeld, um, I think He's fine, this isn't the best role he's ever done and even he's admitted to that since and sort of apologised for it but I still think he does fine. I think he's going to do the character better in No Time To Die, obviously I still haven't seen it but based on the trailer he looks like he's giving it a bit more effort this time around but he was still fine, he was still fine for what he was and I think the plot itself of Spectre was absolutely fine and I don't see why people hate it so much, I think it's a great film. Um, I do think the reveal that uh, Christoph Waltz's character turns out to be Blofeld. I saw that coming a mile off. I mean, it's a film about Spectre. He's the head of Spectre. You have the imagery of him in that sort of uh, jacket that you've come to sort of, you know, relate to Blofeld. Uh, you have him sat there silhouetted, which is an image often you know, seen when it comes to Blofeld. And then when you have that scene where he's got on strapped to the chair and that white cat jumps onto Bond's lap uh, that's just like the first sort of sign of yeah this is the Blofeld reveal um, by the time that happened I was like yeah this is it he is Blofeld and that was that knowledge was then secure in my mind but even before then I knew I knew that was going to be revealed and the weird thing is if you haven't seen the Bond films before then if you hadn't seen the um, the Sean Connery Bond films then the reveal that this is Blofeld would mean nothing. In terms of just the Daniel Craig movies and just this movie on its own, um, he reveals that he is now Ernst Stavro Blofeld and that means nothing in the movie and it means nothing to the characters. So yeah, in terms of his own enclosed story, that reveal doesn't really work. He says it and it seems like it should be a big thing, but it really isn't. In the context of the story and the characters involved, it means nothing. It's just a new name he's given himself. It really only means something to fans of the older Bond films. But being a fan of the older Bond films, it does mean a little something to me. But even so, it's, you know, it wasn't a shocking reveal. I, I saw it come to my off. Despite that, though, I still do really like the movie. <sighs> 
and hopefully I will also like No Time to Die when I eventually see that. Daniel Craig himself, I do really, really enjoy his Bond. I like how he is a lot more sort of rugged and rough, and when it comes to the fighting and the martial arts and such, you really do feel like this guy could kick these people's asses the amount that he does do. It's almost like there's no acting behind it. It's just like, this is a man who can do this stuff. You very much believe that. I also like how his Bond gets hurt a lot more than other people's Bonds. It seems a lot more real. Um, before the Daniel Craig movies, Bond was almost superhuman in how he just got through these situations unscathed and tore down like, armies of enemies uh, whilst getting through almost unhurt himself. When it comes to the Daniel Craig films, it's a lot more believable. He's a person, he's vulnerable, he just somehow manages to get through all of these situations that he finds himself in. But, you know, he does get damaged along the way. And I do really appreciate seeing that represented in the Bond movies. Also, when it just comes to characterization, when it comes to the you know, the things that happen to Bond and how it affects him emotionally, him as an emotional character, but also trying to suppress that emotion, Daniel Craig does a very, very good job at pulling that off. So yeah, now that I've talked a bit about each individual Bond actor in the movies that they're in, I think it's finally time for me to give my ranking. I'm still not sure if I'm happy with this ranking list that I've come up with, but at the same time, if I try to change it, I can't change it to anything better than this. In my current state of mind, this seems, even though it's difficult to rank these, this seems correct. So, at the bottom of the list, but by no means terrible, is George Lazenby. Truly wonderful Bond film, but as Bond, he is the least good of all of them. He's not bad, but he's the least good. And just to be clear, this is not a ranking on who has the best Bond films, because he would probably be higher if that was the case. This is purely based on the actor playing Bond. So next up from George Lazenby is Pierce Brosnan. Again, great actor in the role, really suits the character, but the others are just better for me. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong about him, it's just the others do a better job. It's, it's really difficult to put some of these lower down because I like them all, but that's just how it is. Someone has to be at the bottom and that someone is George Lazenby. Someone has to be second from the bottom and that one is Pierce Brosnan. Next up from Pierce Brosnan, and this is the one that really makes me question this list because I did not expect this actor to be so low down on the list until I wrote the list and since then I've been thinking about it and deciding whether or not to switch him with someone else and get him a bit higher up but at the end of the day I can't I have to put him here and I really really don't want to but I just feel like it's it's right for me personally and my own tastes in what I want in a Bond. I'm putting Roger Moore here. It feels sacrilegious to do so. He would be in most people's top three, if not top two, if not the best. But, I don't know, for, for me, I've got to put him here. And he is great, he is absolutely wonderful, and I do really, really enjoy him in the role. But I just think the other three do a better job of portraying the Bond I want to see. I think based on the three that are left, which is Sean Connery, Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig, you can probably tell the sort of Bond I want to see. And Roger Moore brings a sort of uh, sophisticatedness, a suaveness, a certain emotion to the character which is wonderful, but isn't necessarily one of the most important factors to me when it comes to Bond, so even though I do love Roger Moore, this is where he is on the ranking. In third place, I've put Timothy Dalton, who most people would probably put below Roger Moore, to be fair, but I just think he does such a good job at portraying the Bond from the novel, and I really appreciate that. And I do think he is probably one of the most overlooked actors in the role, and really deserves more love than he gets. I do think he is truly worthy of being in the top three, and he is for me. And then there were two. Sean Connery and Daniel Craig, 
Who do I think is the best? I mean, this isn't easy. It is a tough call. They are both great in the role, and both for similar and different reasons. But obviously the best Bond ever is Sean Connery. Particularly after recently watching through the Daniel Craig movies, it was very difficult not to put him at the top because he just... He brings something to the character that was very much needed and is wonderful in the role. But I can't put anyone higher than the legend that is Sean Connery. He is... He is James Bond and has been since he first played the character in Doctor No. And I don't think it can really be argued that he isn't James Bond. I, mean, I think to me what it comes down to is if, if I close my eyes and you just say the names of characters to me and you might say things like Homer Simpson and I think of Homer Simpson and you might say Doctor Who and I think of Tom Baker. You say James Bond and what immediately comes into my mind is Sean Connery in a suit with a dry vodka martini. In my mind, Sean Connery is who I think of when I think of James Bond. And for that reason, he is the best actor to portray the character in my opinion and is at the top of my ranking. We are done. I do seem to do a pretty good job at uh, finishing these beers at the right time. Anyway, let's get this uh, crossed off on the poster. Well, the second line was a bit wonky, but we'll make do. But anyway, those are my thoughts on the different actors to portray Bond and the movies that they're in and my ultimate ranking of the Bond actors from worst to best <coughs> or should I say from least good to best because at the end of the day I enjoy all the Bond actors in all of their movies there isn't a single one of them that I would skip and I think they all do a great job there's also another beard down and one step closer to the ultimate goal of trying every beer on this poster Bar one, unless you can identify that uh, that bottle in the top left of the poster as something other than Eager Erbia. Again, if you do have any ideas for something else that might be, then let me know, because that would be really, really helpful. Other than that, leave a comment to let me know who your favourite Bond is, or even how you would order them in your own ranking. I'd very much love to see other people's thoughts on who their best Bond is. If you did like this video, then please press like down below to let me know that you liked it. That way I know that you liked it. And if you didn't like it, then feel free to press dislike. I will not be offended. And if you did enjoy this video and want to see more of them, then please subscribe to the channel to get notified when new ones come up. And to actually get notified, then ring the notification bell as well. Other than that, we are done. That is a video and there is nothing else to say. So I will close it off now. Thank you very much for watching. If you did, I really do appreciate it. Other than that, I have been Parsons. Brad Parsons.